Okay, this is part two of clarifying the doctrine of the Trinity of God. Thanks for watching. Here we go. Immediately after Adam's sin, they had to leave out the Garden of Eden, and then their first, uh, I guess maybe their, maybe the second born, so I'm not sure which order it was. Um, you had Cain and Abel. Maybe Cain was first. Anyway, uh, so as a result of that bloodline being painted by Adam, his son Abel was killed by his brother Cain. So from there on, so Christ could have been born of uh, this tainted bloodline. That's why he had to be born of this uh, holy bloodline provided by God. <clears throat> so next we see John 1.18. Um, we're told no man has seen God at any time. That's why I talked about a while ago. No man has seen God at any time. It had to come down in a theophany of some sort. Um, it says, The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So Jesus had seen the Father as they were all in one. They were one. Not in agreement and all like that, like some of the cults say. Well, uh, well, Jesus said, I and my Father are one because um, he just meant one in, in agreement. Uh, no, they one in that they were the same. Uh, it's just uh, different persons of the Trinity that we see playing out different, different and yet sometimes the same, like creation, for example. Uh, so then, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So, God um, was presented to the people by Jesus, who saw firsthand. Uh, it's like uh, God uh, be, be manifest in the flesh. That means like he was robed in flesh when he came down. Obviously, uh, Jesus had seen God because he is God. So, Romans 9 5 speaks uh, concerning Christ as being God, um, of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forevermore. Amen. So it speaks about, you want to follow the full thought on that? 9 5. Okay, it says, Whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Yeah. So Christ came in flesh. Obviously, that's kind of like a no-brainer. Everybody comes into the world in the flesh. Um, but in his case, he was God that manifested the flesh. That's what the verse is implying there. And God blessed him forevermore. Um, so in Colossians 2, 9, here we see... Uh, says, for in him, speaking about Christ, dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, it's like when Jesus asked Thomas, when they, when he asked him, will you show us the Father? And he says, Thomas, have I been with you so long? And yet, you ask me, show me the Father? He says, um, that he himself is God. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. So here he says, uh, whom concerning fire, uh, for in him, Christ dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So with uh, God, that's why it's essential that Christ came to earth to be our Savior, because in him is no sin, no darkness, no guile, uh, not one hint of a uh, spot or blemish. Otherwise, him being a sacrifice for our sins would be, you know, uh, he would be disqualified. So how, how much more qualified could you be that the one who declared all this, you know, curse upon the earth, um, would then have a law that would say, um, bring a spotless lamb and, uh, and you can be forgiven. And then therefore God did that in his, in his own flesh. So, um, John 20 and verse 28 says in, after uh, Thomas was doubting, he had thought, because he wasn't there when Christ appeared 
uh, like one of the first times to the group of the other uh, disciples. Um, he was away doing something. So he came back to the disciples and said, you dismissed him, Christ was here. And uh, I'm going to read some of that. Maybe prior to that, where Jesus uh, Boyd said, I will not believe. Okay. And um, I thought it was interesting because um, Thomas was that doubting disciple and um, he had to, you know, see the evidence of the nail prints and Jesus. Um, and uh, so I will read here in John chapter 20, verse 28, and a little bit before that. Um, after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. Yeah, back up just to 4, 24. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. So this is where Thomas sees Jesus. Mm -hmm. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he, talking about Thomas, said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Yeah, so here we see that Thomas had been with him all the time and uh, had heard all of Christ's speeches and miracles that he had seen and so forth, uh, doubted. But when he saw Christ alive from the dead, in his presence, he didn't have to put his hands in his finger in his hands, so, you know, and side, so forth like that. He uh, he immediately exclaimed, um, "My Lord and my God." He wasn't using that as a swear word, you know, like, but he was making an exclamation there. And so, what Thomas was doing, either if what you who are out there are believing what we're saying is so then um, Thomas broke the Ten Commandments of the first two you're saying well Jesus is a God well then if that's so then Thomas broke the two commandments and Jesus allowed him to he didn't rebuke him um, see over the book of Revelation John sees this mighty angel standing before him and he's just like um, petrified you know he falls down and worships the angel and the angel says no Tom, uh, John get up he said, I'm a man as yourself. Worship God. Now, um, if Jesus was not God, then he would have said, wait a minute, Thomas, you got it all wrong. Um, yes, I got rose again from the dead, but um, the Father rose me up from the dead. And so we need to give him all praise. Worship God. No, he can say that. And in fact, uh, not only did Jesus receive worship here, but over in the book of Matthew, if you look carefully, you'll see that there's eight different times where Jesus was worshipped. Not one time do you say, no, don't worship me, worship God. Um, so uh, we have a dilemma there. Either Jesus invoked uh, and invited and accepted worship as God, and therefore we have a, a you know, person that's an imposter as being someone who's perfect, or in fact that he is perfect because he's God, and he's rightfully so receiving worship as God. So um, then we see in Philippians 2, 6. Um, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So I think I wanted to make a comment about that verse. Um, it's very important that we study the subject today and understand it today as well because we cannot come to God in salvation 
if we don't believe that he is who he said he is. So um, let me encourage you to, to um, not just take what we say, but to also um, be looking up and searching these scriptures with us. And God says, if you search for me with all your heart, you will find me. Yeah, so in this verse here, it says uh, God was uh, in the form of man, and that was Jesus. Kind of way of stating it. Philippians 2, 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not to be a uh, robber, to be equal to God. Uh, Jesus didn't see it anything like uh, I'm competing against God or anything like that because he was God. Uh, in modern versions talk about like uh, Jesus didn't think it was something to be grasped at uh, as like being God. He didn't have to grasp at it. You know, you think of something like you're hanging on the edge of a cliff and you're grasping for a, 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 a crevice to pull yourself up. No, Jesus didn't grasp at being God. Um, and he didn't think it was robbery to be equal to God because he was God. Um, so I want to bring out this other point. I thought I had it in here. But showing the uh, interchangeableness of the names of God. Okay, in Genesis 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning God created heaven and the earth. Uh, so God created heaven and the earth. And then over in the Colossians 1.16, speaking of Christ, it says, For by him, or you can put in him, instead of putting Christ. For by Christ were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, and so forth. So, um, God created heaven and the earth, and basically all things there in, because we're told of, you know, the next six days of creation. So, but then here it says Jesus created. So that there again shows a further development of what was going on. Yet the Father, who as we spoke about earlier, created all things. The Spirit of God is present at the time of creation. And then also the uh, uh, Christ here says he created. So the interchangeableness of the name of God. Same God. Um, I, I thought it was in this section here. Let's see. Yeah. Then, uh, in 2 Peter 1, 1, it uh, speaks about to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness, notice the word singular, in this letter, righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So we're saved and we're obtained by this precious faith uh, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now you wouldn't say that about two different people. You can use it singularly, righteousness. You'd say the righteousnesses of God and Jesus. So there again, the righteousnesses of God who is Jesus. All in one. Um, so then God, the Holy Spirit, is being addressed in this part and having some uh, scriptural support. Acts 5, 3 through 4, we touched on that a while ago about um, the uh, interchangeableness of the names of God and uh, mentioned. But this uh, being shown before as God, the Holy Ghost, then we'll emphasize that again. Uh, it says, Why hath Satan filled thy heart? Speaking of Ananias, uh, thou hast not lied. Uh, why is that? Why is Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? So uh, the Holy Ghost here is being lied to. Then he says, "Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God." So you got the Holy Ghost and God there again, speaking of uh, the same person. But notice who put it in Ananias' heart to come up with this idea. It was Satan filled his heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. And there again, you know, you can't lie to um, a power go up to a light socket or go up to a uh, burning you know uh, natural gas flame and lie to it you know, uh, but you can't lie to a person the person of the Holy Spirit um, therefore God the Holy Spirit addresses the same person and therefore uh, is God and can be lied to 
Um, it's 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. It says, Oh, I was going to make a little comment, too, about the Holy Spirit, that that is the part of the Godhead that comes to indwell your soul, the part of you that lives forever, when you get saved. So um, he comes to indwell us, and he also promised that he would be our comforter. So, yes, we see definitively that he is um, God and He um, has come to fulfill those two roles in our lives. Yeah, and in 1 Corinthians 2 10 through 11, hopefully you've gotten this all down. Now, if you want to, you can actually, uh, I guess, leave us a message or comment or something like that. And just, if you want a copy of this for your own study or for purposes and stuff like that to uh, use as building your faith up, we can send you a copy of it. Um, and an email, which I got attached to. Um, but um, it says, But God hath revealed from them, speaking about God's wisdom, unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So we're seeing that the Spirit of God is used by God to convey truth to us and reveal things and teach us and he has, God uses the spirit to search things so um, and the question about like I guess you think well how can God be omnipresent going back to that question all here well you have God the Father seated on the throne but his spirit uh, is everywhere God the spirit you can figure God uh, and the spirit Holy Spirit are one so in this case, uh, he comes about, God uses the Spirit to convey his truth. Now, God wouldn't employ an angel, although he does at times, but it wouldn't be like solely, you know, it wouldn't be of God himself. Um, but the Spirit of God is he who advances truth and searches us out because, you know, like David, Psalmist says, search me, O God, and see if there be any wickedness in me. Uh, if we think of ourselves more highly than we ought, then that's the pride. And so uh, pride goes to the destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So if we think of ourselves, I'm a good person. I haven't done anything bad. Well, have you ever lied? Have you ever dishonored your mom, dad, or uh, stolen something? Then you're guilty. And so you need a savior. That's what this whole topic is about today. God coming down to earth to redeem us. Um, and so, next we see, um, as part of, of that, the, the conclusion of this is that the Spirit of God possesses the attributes of God and being omniscient. The Spirit of God has that same quality. None of us can say you know, we're omniscient. Now, Jesus had that same ability to be omniscient, a little side note, because he was seated at Nicodemus' house and uh, there was a woman that came to Jesus and was washing his feet with her hand and, and water and all like that. And so Nicodemus thought to himself, says, this man was a prophet. And he would know this woman's, uh, you know, bad woman. And then he didn't say anything. He just thought to himself. And so Jesus said, uh, you know, uh, why, uh, this, why have you thought these things against this woman, you know, uh, and so forth. So Jesus says that. That quality uh, of distinction there being on mission. <clears throat> so, next we see in Ephesians 2, verse 22, it says, In whom, speaking about the Lord, in the Lord, ye are also built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Why? If you compare that to verse uh, 6, 19 through 20 in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, it says, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Glorify God in your body. So, our body is meant to be the dwelling place for God. Of course, as I said, God the Father is seated in heaven on the throne. And so, He is able to indwell you by a, your repentance and turning from your sin and receiving Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for your sin penalty and account and all like that. But once you do that, then 
you are then a clean vessel for God to come in and dwell, and your body is the temple of God. That's why I say he wants to destroy people's lives through drugs and all this uh, stuff that disqualifies them to be a, a vessel for God to live in. So we have a, us here being shown that the Spirit of God is, is living in us as God says you build it together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And that uh, our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. So the conclusion of this is that uh, these two verses show the sameness or interchangeableness of the Holy Ghost and God, whichever uh, which abides in the believer's body, the two names are interchangeable. And it's like the Jesus says, Does Jesus dwell in your heart? Uh, well, it's the same as saying that is the Holy Ghost living in you? Because there's another place in the scriptures where I read here recently that talked about the spirit of Jesus Christ. And so uh, the, the other thing too is when Jesus said, I'll send you another comforter, it's not like a different one. It's going to be that of the same type. In other words, like if you go, let's say if you got a uh, $100 bill, for example, and you swap it and get one that's um, Two fifties. It's one of the same, but it's equal the same, even though they look different. It's kind of a bad analogy, but still, it's the same equality there. Of Christ left, and then He's promised to give us that which is of the same, the Holy Spirit, as a comforter. So He comes in as well as in our bodies once we get saved and empowers us and to do right and so forth. Um, so Job, in Job 33, 4, um, says, The Spirit of God hath made me, Job says, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. So the Spirit of God created man, is what he's saying. And then the breath of God entered into him, made him a living soul. Uh, which we find that in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So the conclusion of this, what Job said versus what Moses wrote in Genesis account, uh, that these verses use the Holy Spirit and God, in this case Jehovah, Elohim, uh, interchangeably at created man. The Spirit of God hath made him. And then over here, in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man. Same thing. Same person. Um, then Romans 8, 11 says, But if the spirit of him, speaking of God, that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you. So there again, you got the spirit. Um, and in another place it says that God has raised Christ from the dead. Uh, speaking of the Father. So these are all uses of God and his name interchangeably doing this very same thing. So you have um, the spirit of him, God, that raised up Jesus from the dead uh, to dwell in you, and so forth. Uh, and it says in Romans 10, 9, that thou shalt believe in, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So in Romans 8, 11, the Holy Spirit raises up Jesus from the dead. And then Romans 10, 9 says that God raised Jesus from the dead. Which is it? It's both. Because it's the same. It's interchangeable. It's like uh, if you uh, I call Heather, Heather, and uh, our daughter calls her mother, then uh, she's the same person. Just, you know, does the same thing. She'll look at the meal. She'll do her laundry or whatever. Uh, so we say, uh, thank you for doing my laundry, Heather. And then Christina will say, thank you for doing my laundry, Mom. So, same act, same person, different names. Um, another comforting thought um, was the last part of this verse. Um, so, if we have already died and we are already Christians um, before we died, uh, we'd already um, put our faith in Jesus Christ as the one and only true Savior of the world, and we repented of our sins. Then God promises here in the last part of this verse 
to raise up our mortal bodies. That's uh, mortal means um, bodies that die. He promises to raise them up again to meet him in the air at the time of the rapture. So let me read the last part of this verse. Well, let me just read the whole verse. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, that's the Holy Spirit dwelling in you when you get saved, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, that means to make alive, your mortal bodies, bodies that died, by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Yeah, so it was promised and prophesied before that Jesus would be raised from the dead, and that happened. And if you're in Christ, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, which of course you've got to think about all hell, Satan and everybody else, his cohorts, were fighting and fighting and hoping that he wouldn't get raised from the dead. Well, now Jesus has the keys to death and hell. So um, that same power that raised Christ from the dead is going to raise us up who believe. And even the ones who don't believe, they're going to be raised up too, only to a fearful judgment to be cast into hell. So the conclusion of this part here is that uh, the Holy Ghost and God, who resurrected Jesus, are used interchangeably. And um, then in 2 Timothy 3.16, we're told all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then you compare that to 1 Peter 1.21. 1, uh, 1 it uh, says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, um, so in 2 Peter 3.16, it says also, Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So God inspired Scripture to be written. And yet the people who wrote it down, these holy men, these some 40 prophets and writers, um, did so by God, the Holy Ghost. So they're moved by the Holy Ghost. The conclusion is that these verses state that both God and the Holy Ghost endowed men with Scriptures. No one wants to write. And so therefore these Two names that used interchangeably expresses the same person, the uh, same God. It's not like two gods, you know, one telling the writer one thing, another one telling another thing. It was simultaneous, just concurrent, such as like that. Um, so, this little section here will kind of delve into just a little touching up of what we did a while ago with uh, creation, but it's important to state this last little piece. Uh, so God, by the three persons of the Holy, uh, by the Trinity, by the Godhead, created all things that are visible and invisible. We see the verses, uh, and there again, uh, God the Son, Jesus Christ, Colossians 1.16 says, For by him, speaking about Jesus, were all things created, better in heaven, better in earth, visible and invisible. All things were created by him for, and for him. So, okay, we're told that Jesus created everything. Now look at Psalm 33, 6. It says, By the word of the Lord, in all caps, were the heavens made, and all the host of them, by the breath of his mouth. So the word, we'll get a little bit more fuller picture here in this, because it says, the word of the Lord. So Jesus said, I am uh, uh, the word. You know, it says that about in John 1 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word here, by the Word, is put in Jesus, by Jesus, uh, who's the Word of God, of the Lord, where the heavens made, and that by the breath, as we spoke about a while ago, which is the Spirit of God mouth. So God thought what to do. He pronounced what he said, he spoke the world into existence, and he, when he spoke the words, that's Jesus. Jesus is the word, and by the breath of his mouth, that's where we get the word uh, pneuma. It's a Greek word. It means spirit or wind. You hear on pneumatics. You've got pneumatic tools or whatever. Um, so when God spoke forth the words, his wind, his spirit spoke the word. So you got all three parts of the Trinity in the same God. So it's God interchangeably done. You know, part of the, uh, the portion of the creation that was made. Did God create the heavens and the earth? Yes. Did Jesus? Yes. Did the Spirit? Yes. 
when do you do it? Simultaneously, concurrent. Uh, and so then God the Father in Genesis 2, 4b, we should say, it says, in the day that the Lord God made the heaven and earth, that earth and heaven. So um, there you're emphasizing Jehovah Elohim. So you have Jesus and Colossians. Psalms 33 spoke about the Spirit, and of course the other two parts of the Trinity. Uh, and then this part here speaks about God the Father uh, in Genesis 2, 4, the, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So hopefully that's uh, helped and clear up some of that. There's probably numerous other verses, but uh, that's just what I concluded some years ago, putting together a doctrinal statement of this section, study on the Trinity of God with biblical supports. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, I would just like to encourage you if you have any questions let us know we um, would love to rejoice with you to be able to find out that um, hopefully if you don't know Jesus as your Savior that today you would make that very important decision in your life because Jesus is coming back very very soon and Jesus loves you with an everlasting love and he doesn't want anyone to be left behind. He wants to include you. Um, and so we would love to rejoice with you if you did decide to make today your day of salvation, which is the most important decision that you can make in your life. So um, whether you're having a good day or whether you're very sick, with something like COVID or maybe you're trapped in a country like Afghanistan or in another closed country, um, communist country somewhere. Um, Jesus loves you just the same and he definitely wants you to have that eternal security in your heart. So please let us hear back from you. If you have any questions, we'd um, love to answer those for you. Call the Lord while he may be found. And uh, just do a simple prayer like the man that Jesus talked about. And there was two people praying. One was a righteous man, a uh, self-righteous man, a publican, and the other was just a sinner. The one who said, I thank thee, God, that I'm not as this man. I give a tithe every day. I, I pray every day and all this stuff. He said, Jesus said that he went away still the same, uh, not knowing God, knowing that he just was, said he prayed within himself, basically prayed to himself. But the other man, he would be like him, where he just said, Lord, didn't he lift his eyes to the heavens? He just said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's what you have to do, is acknowledge your sinner. Call upon Christ, who is the one who is the life giver. And he gave his life, so therefore he's the life giver and can save you. And then just call on him to save you, fill you with his Holy Spirit, and then deliver him. Uh, you know, don't keep sinning, lest the worst thing come upon you. Jesus said. Thanks for watching. Uh, see you next time we're on. Uh, and maybe, uh, maybe it won't be the next time. The Lord's going to come at any minute. Might be here, there, or in the air. <laughs> so, thanks for watching.